Hey everyone, as you're joining, it's great to see everybody via Zoom. We'll get started in just a few seconds, just allowing people to arrive. Well, hey everybody. My name is Vanessa Oliver, and I am one of the dietitians with the UK Health and Wellness Program. Today, I'll be going through some seasonal recipes with Chef T Chef Tanya. Sorry, Chef T. I was going to say both things at once. Apparently, uh, with the Food Connection, we're going to tag team some seasonal, delicious, and healthful. Um, fall recipes using produce that you may have gotten in your CSA or just seen at the farmer's market. I'll be doing a really simple butternut squash soup and Chef T will be doing a kale salad demo and then we'll jump into some Q&A. Um, just some housekeeping reminding everyone to keep your mics muted for the duration of this demo. We are recording this. Um, we'll be able to send you a link to the YouTube um, recording. So you all will be able to watch this on demand if you need to step away for any reason today. And then we'll also send you uh, documents that will have the recipe as well as some photographs that we took today. So I hope that works for everybody. Um, just really briefly before I get into this butternut squash soup, that's so simple, you're gonna love it. I want to briefly talk about the University of Kentucky CSA voucher program. Um, some of you may already have um, bought shares using these vouchers, but essentially if you are a UK um, or if you are an employee rather on a UK health plan, then you're eligible to use either a $100 or $200 voucher toward the cost of your purchase of a share from our coalition of CSA farms. This program has been around for six years. It's really hard to believe. Um, it's been a great six years. We've established a lot of relationships, not only with our partner farms, but also with the partners that we're working with here today, the Organic Association of Kentucky, as well as the Kentucky Farm Share Coalition. And they'll be facilitating the chat. You may also see their faces on the video from time to time today. But the CSA Voucher Program started in 2016 with just a pilot study and 200 people. We're now up to about 700 employees who are using this voucher toward their CSA share. And we're so happy to have them participate in this very innovative, really the first of its kind in the country, workplace CSA voucher program. Um, for 2022, we're already working really hard behind the scenes to expand the number of partner farms and vouchers for next season. So stay tuned if you're not already a CSA voucher um, holder and you want to learn more, you can go to our UK Health and Wellness website, which is uky.edu slash HR slash uh, work and well-being. Um, you can also, I believe Katie is dropping that link in the chat too. So if you are already a CSA voucher holder and were a participant for this 2021 season, do stay tuned to for a survey that we'll be sending out uh, later this month just to hear how your season went. All right, so um, some resources too that are available to any CSA voucher holder. Of course, you will be getting a lot of recipes and communication from whatever farm that you're a shareholder with, but we like to put some recipes, um, make some recipes available for you too. So those are available on the UK Health and Wellness blog. We also have a private Facebook group called UK Employees with the CSA. Um, you'll be able to join that as well. We promote that link too. You can also just follow Eat Well Dietitians on Facebook. That is a sort of a, our account, if you will, um, where we post lots of just sort of nutrition resources, not just recipes, but there's definitely some on there as well as some good evidence-based nutrition guidelines and just whatever I think people might find interesting um, and to read on Facebook. So hopefully you guys will be able to follow along there too. Okay, so I think it's about time to get into this recipe. 
What do you think, Chef T? Yeah, I'm getting hungry. All right, yeah, me too. Okay, so we're gonna, again, kind of tag team so you won't be looking at my face the whole time. Um, but today I'm gonna be talking a little bit about butternut squash. I think a lot of people, um, if they're looking to expand their kind of vegetable horizons, butternut squash is a really sort of gentle way to get in there. Um, these, you know, they come in all different kinds of sizes. They're typically going to be this shape. When you pick one out, you want it to be firm, free of blemishes, and a little bit heavy for its size. Um, but they can be anywhere from two to three to four pounds like this one, or teeny, teeny, tiny like that little butter baby squash that we got from Rough Draft Farmstead. This one is from Scott Evans in Georgetown, Madison County, rather, sorry. And this one is called Quantum, this brand, or rather this breed. Um, he really thinks that this one is the best. So if you can hit up the Lexington Farmer's Market and find Scott, he's on the short street side and see if you can maybe grab some butternut squash from him. But I like to use this for a soup because it's generally pretty easy to cut. Um, and the way that I like to cut these, I'll usually cut the neck off first because that way it gives me a little bit easier method to handle it. Then I'll cut off the sides, get the tips off there too. Of course, you can save that if you maybe save veggie scraps in the freezer for stock that'll add a nice sort of earthy quality to your stocks. Um, there are methods too where you can, if you have trouble maybe using a big knife or if it just makes you a little bit nervous, a nice way to break down a butternut squash is to pierce it several times with the tip of a knife and then you can sort of blast it in the microwave for about three to four minutes depending on the size of the squash and that'll make it a little bit easier to cut into. Okay, so if you feel like you just are a little nervous or don't have the skill, never fear, you can still get into that butternut squash. Um, if that still doesn't work for you, you can absolutely find pre-peeled, pre-cut squash in your grocery store, usually in the produce section, it'll be bagged. Sometimes you can even find locally grown butternut squash. That's been processed this way. I know that the food chain has been selling that um, from farms in the area too. So you have a lot of different options if you do want to try making this recipe with butternut squash. But once I've got it separated like that, this particular recipe roasts the squash ahead of time, so you don't have to worry about peeling it. Beside cutting butternut squash, I think the other thing that people are really nervous about with squash is peeling the squash. I will say it helps if you have a sharp peeler. Um, I also like the Y peeler. Much better. Yeah, so when I say a Y peeler, there, you know, I think a lot of us sort of in our minds think of that kind of slightly rusty stainless steel potato peeler that our grandmothers have. It's not the one that I'm talking about today. This one is shorter and squatter and it has a Y-shaped blade and that's why it's called a Y peeler. And it's very um, easy to use on a broad surface such as this butternut squash. But again, once I have this broken down, I'll probably put it on its flat surface and cut. Started cutting. This is a nice, dense, fresh squash. Because it's so early in the season, there's gonna be a lot of freshness here. Look at that beautiful color, that beautiful, dense flesh that you can see here. And once I've got this broken down, you can see here in the bulb, this is where the seeds live. It's up to you if you wanna save these seeds, but either way, you can just grab a spoon and go on scoop it up and I'm put it in the bowl. Now if you do want to go on and use these seeds as a garnish for this soup, you absolutely can. What you'll want to do is separate the seeds from the pulp that comes out. I usually like to simmer them in a little bit of salted water for about 10 minutes or so and then I'll put them in the oven at about 375, 400. You can sometimes hear them popping um, as they start to cook. In fact, they popped out of the oven while we were prepping them uh, earlier this afternoon. So um, when they're in the oven, you can season them with a little bit of oil, maybe some salt. I threw on some curry powder because there's a little bit of curry powder in the soup. But that's basically how you would break down a squash to get ready for roasting. And I've gone ahead and pre-roasted some squash to make this soup. 
The great thing about pre-roasting a squash for a soup of this nature, besides not having to peel it, is when you roast it, and I've roasted this skin side up at about 375 or 400 for Four. about 400, 400 degrees um, for about 20, 25, 30 minutes. It depends on the size of your squash. Um, really, you'll just want the tip of your knife to be able to pierce it pretty easily. But when you do that, you have all of that surface area touching the hot pan. And as it roasts, it caramelizes. So not only is it developing this beautiful color, it's developing more flavor and even a slight change in texture too, which is really interesting for a soup that's otherwise pureed, right? So you're gonna have a lot of nice additions to your soup. And I just seasoned it with salt and pepper when I roasted it. You could throw other spices on there too, if you wanted. What do you think? Maybe some curry powder, some turmeric. Some turmeric, you could even go like North African. And if you like heat, sweet, sweet and hot go really well together. Absolutely. So what I'm gonna do now is just simply put this soup together. I've got my ingredients all laid out. Those of you who have watched these videos before know I'm a big fan of doing that. Um, this is called getting your mise in plus or just getting your ingredients all together. So I've got my pan heating up here. I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil. Let that come up just a little bit. And I've got some onion that is chopped. The recipe calls for a half a cup to a cup of onion. And this is just regular white onion putting that in the pot. Also gonna put in a little bit of garlic that's just smashed a little bit since the soup is gonna be pureed anyway. You don't have to worry too, too much about the size of the chunks, but just keep in mind that if you keep all of your veggies roughly the same size, then they're gonna cook at roughly the same pace and that's just gonna get you a little bit of a better product, right? So just thinking about that. This recipe calls for three to four cloves of garlic. My garlic cloves were pretty big, so you can see, so I'm using a little bit less and a really nice way to, or easy way to get the skin off the garlic, as well as maybe take out some frustrations that you might be feeling, is just to lay the clove flat on the board. Use the flat of your hand. Yeah, you can even go a little bit more aggressive if you wanted to but that really gets the peel off very easily. Of course, you can use pre-peeled garlic too, if that's just easier for you. So I've got my garlic. Maybe you can hear it sizzling. And that's gonna cook for about seven to 10 minutes. You wanna keep an eye on it, all right? You don't want it to get too dark, but you don't want it to take too long either. I've got my flame on a medium, medium high heat, and I'm just looking for the onions to soften and get a little bit of color. Once that happens, then I've got my squash here that's already roasted, and I'm using a spoon to scoop it out, but honestly, and I'm going to ask Tanya about this, do you like to use the spoon? I love the squash. When I'm pureed, I yeah. do. Yeah, I think especially it's just for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the skin's got a lot of fiber, right? And particularly if you're getting it local from a farmer that you know, and you know what their growing practices are and they align with what your values are, you may or may not want to peel your squash. You are going to be getting a little bit of extra fiber if you don't. And particularly to um, when it's younger squash, a little bit earlier in the season, we're just starting this fall season right now in early October, um, that peel, you can see how thin it is, right? So it's not really, going to affect the flavor of the soup. It might affect the color just a little bit. But either way, you can use a spoon or see how easily I'm peeling off this skin. It just comes right off. And so I'm just going to throw that in my pan. And again, we'll have this recipe for you after the demo, but super easy, even with this little baby squash here. So, perfect. And once I've got my squash all in there, 
I'm going to add some spices as well. So I'm going to be adding a little bit of curry powder here. And you can really do this to taste. Start off with about half a teaspoon. And then you can always add just a little bit more. I'm going to add a bay leaf. What's your position on bay leaves, Kenya? I absolutely adore them. I think they should make a perfume out of bay leaves, first of all. <laughs> when we get a fresh jar, I just inhale. <laughs> they are so different when they are fresh. They have that really beautiful aroma. And that's a really good sort of thing to keep in mind with spices in general. Um, certainly if they're ground, but even if they're whole, you want to make sure that you're refreshing your spice cabinet or spice drawer about every three to three six months. months yeah, so. yeah, depending on what you have. If you can't smell it, it's really unlikely that it's going to have any flavor, to be honest. Most of those essential oils that create the flavor have been released to the atmosphere. If you can't really smell it, you're not going to get that flavor. So, so I've got some butternut um, squash soup going there with the bay leaf. I'm going to add a little bit of salt, as well as a little bit of ground black pepper. You can really use that salt and pepper to taste. And then I'm going to go on and add some liquid, OK? So I am using just a boxed veggie broth. You could certainly use bouillon cubes. You could use water if you prefer, OK? If you do use water instead of salt, then you'll probably need to add just a little bit more salt. But this is just a regular veggie broth. The recipe does call for You hear that nice sizzle as I add it in there. And if people are using the uh, jarred or the pre minced garlic, yeah. what would you suggest for an equivalent of a clove? Yeah, it's usually about a teaspoon, isn't yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. so um, a teaspoon of chopped garlic is usually equivalent to a clove. Again, I kind of have these monster cloves, so you might just have to use your judgment and also depending on how much you like garlic. Yeah. I wish it's a tablespoon. So. I really <laughs> like garlic. So, um, yeah, maybe depending on how you feel about it, do or do not come to my house when I am cooking. <laughs> so, I've got this going. Um, now that I've got my liquid in, I'm going to add just a little bit of um, the recipe calls for sugar, but I thought it would be cool if I used some local maple syrup. Um, so, this is from Turtleback Ridge. They're in Robertson County, which, fun fact, the smallest county in Kentucky. Yep. Um, but Turtleback Ridge does a lot of fun things. They have a little brewery on site, and they make their own maple syrup. Um, so I'm going to add a little bit of that. That's your preference if you want to use sugar or maple or nothing at all. You know, your butternut squash might just be sweet enough for you. Because um, butternut squash is um, has a lot of natural sugar. Um, it's known as a complex carbohydrate, right? Um, so a lot of people do like to um, use that as maybe their carb for their meal, for example. It's really high in vitamin C as well as fiber. And since it's orange, you probably already know this, but it's a really super good source of vitamin A. It has something like three or four times of your recommended daily needs of vitamin A. So vitamin A is good for all sorts of things it's an anti since it's an antioxidant, but it's most often associated with eye health and cancer prevention. So um, if you're looking to get some of those brightly colored fall vegetables in there, butternut squash is a really great way to do it. Um, Tanya will be using kale, and we'll be talking about the nutritional benefits of kale as well, but I love butternut squash and kale together. Together, yes. They are delightful. Um, Tanya will be using an orange, secret orange vegetable in her kale salad too. So you can always uh, mix things up just a little bit. So once you've got your, your squash sort of your soup coming up to a simmer, um, this is sort of with any kind of soup that has dairy in it. You let the water or the broth sort of cook first with your vegetables, and then you add your dairy a little bit later, because otherwise sometimes you can get a little funny, clumpy. right? A little clumpy, yeah, a little curdly. We don't want that. Um, so in this particular recipe, once your soup goes for a little bit, then we add a little bit of, this is cow's milk, okay? Um, the recipe calls for about two cups. The recipe does call for low fat. 
you use what you want to use. You don't even have to use cow's milk if you don't want to. Um, if you would like to use a non-dairy milk, then usually something like soy milk takes heat pretty well, or you could go in a different direction flavor-wise and use a coconut milk. That would be delicious, particularly with the little bit of buttery powder that we've got going on in there. So you just sort of let that simmer once you've added the milk, right? Comes up to temperature, um, taste it for salt and pepper, and then you'll be able to use um, either an immersion blender or a food processor or a blender to get it nice and smooth, okay? I did use an immersion blender today. This is just a really simple model. I think there's very fancy models out there now, um, but it's got two speeds. I love it. Every time I use mine at home, my husband laughs at me, but I'm always like, God, I love my immersion blender because it just makes things really, really simple. Um, sometimes if you use a food processor or blender, you got to worry about the lid popping off and then you have soup on the ceiling and you probably don't want that. So um, if you can pick one up, then great. Um, if not, you can just be very careful and use a blender. Um, you would, if you do, do not put the whole soup into the blender. Maybe do a third and then put the lid on and then put a towel over the lid and start it off on low if you can. All right, Tanya is really emphatically nodding on the <laughs> side of the screen here. So just be careful if you do do that. Um, and then just blend it to your taste. And then I've got a beautiful example of the soup right here, okay? You can see that it's really nice and smooth. The color is beautiful. I've got some of those seeds that I saved and roasted with a little bit of curry powder on top and then just a little sprig of seasonal herb. This is thyme. Um, some sage would be really lovely or, you know, no herb at all if you, uh, if you don't want that. But it's really delicious. Um, I'm excited to eat this for lunch. Oh, it's so good. Even if it's a little bit lukewarm. Um, since it's been sitting there for a little bit. But I hope this is something that you all will be able to enjoy at home. Again, we'll send out those recipes to you. I'm going to get rid of some of my stuff, and Chef T is going to come in and make some kale salad. Um, Vanessa, we had a quick question. What brand is your immersion blender? It is Braun. <laughs> That's B-R-A-U-N. But I mean, you think it would be B-R-A-W-N, right? <laughs> awesome. Thank you. It'll take just a moment for the switch out here. Any other questions while we're switching out to, if you like? Yeah, Vanessa, we had lots of great questions come in through um, just about prepping the squash and um, and then spices to add like cumin and chili powder. So you're just talking, I don't know, do you ever make your own kind of curry powder or do you always kind of use a, a pre-mix? You know, it kind of depends on what mood I'm in, um, but often I use a blend of spices that I don't know if I would call them a curry powder, but I suppose I could because curry powder just means a blend of spices, right? There's not going to be one kind of curry powder. It doesn't even have to have turmeric in it. So you can really use any sort of blend that appeals to you. I love cumin and coriander with squash. I love cinnamon. I love chili powder. Um, all of those sort of nice, warm spices. Yeah, yeah. Anything really earthy, smoky, with a little bit of a kick? Smoked paprika. Oh yeah. Uh, anything like that. It goes so well with that sweet earthiness of the yes, butter. Absolutely. All right. That was quick. <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> All right. So as a, I'll take this off so you can hear a little bit better. Um, but as an accompaniment to this beautiful fall squash soup, I was trying to come up with a salad with things that you might either be receiving in your CSA box or like Vanessa said, that you might see at the farmer's market or at your local co-op. Um, so I've 
blended a bunch of stuff together. Now, I don't think my sweet potato is orange. I'm pretty sure it might be a, an Asian variety. So those have white flesh or sometimes they even have purple flesh with sort of maroon or purple skin on them. Uh, I also have some beautiful local kale here. Uh, and if you're not a big fan of kale because of its bitterness or its toughness, then try it in fall and winter because the cooler temperatures are going to mean a lot more sweetness, less bitterness, and tenderness. Even though this is fully mature kale, it is super tender. You could pretty much eat it like this, but I'm going to show you a tip to uh, have your salad out of fully mature kale uh, in the fall and winter. I also have just a wee bit of arugula. Um, you could use spinach, you could use mescaline or any kind of mix of greens that you want. I've got a couple bunches of these, a little bit more than that. So here's uh, my sweet potato. I also have some teeny tiny baby beets. And I know that beets are a polarizing vegetable. <laughs> If nothing else, you either love them or you hate them, or um, like me, you hated them in your youth, but grew to love them later on. Um, I'm going to show you with this recipe, it's really nice. These are teeny tiny local organic beets. They've been put, look at how small. I mean, my thumb, they're so cute, is bigger than this. Um, when, when number one, that's the number one difference. If you've had just canned beets or the really big grocery store beets that may have been sitting around in a warehouse for a month before they get there, there's a big difference. So that number one. Number two, we're going to be using a vinaigrette with a lot of acid to it, and that is going to be a wonderful balance out to all the sweet earthiness of these beets. I also have a local red onion. You can use any onion. I do like onion for depth of flavor. It has to me a bit more umami uh, and some, some just really well-rounded flavors. And we're going to stop right there uh, and then I'll get to some to the dressing and some accompaniments for this salad. The first thing you're going to want to do though is get your sweet potato in the oven. It is, uh, I, I usually just wash my sweet potatoes and especially if they're like this and not much bigger than this, I'll just wash it and uh, oven may care sometimes. I just throw mine in on the rack. <laughs> now some people may not want to do that because the sugars can caramelize and leak out. So I do have a um, roasting pan here that has some parchment on here. Save yourself some scrubbing, use parchment. I am also going to just throw my beets on here. Uh, I hope you can see, let me push this down on the cutting board a little bit more. Maybe middle of the road, right there we go. And I'll slide this over here. So when you get beets, if they have greens or these have been trimmed down to the stem, but you wanna go ahead once you get them home, once you get your CSA box home and take the greens off. The greens will suck some of the um, moisture out of your roots. Any kind of root, turnips, carrots, what have you that has greens on it, go ahead and pull all of those off. Let me use that for my discard. So get that off even before if you're just storing them. That way your roots won't get all wilted and soft quickly. Now I'm going to take off just a little bit of this root. Uh, if I were serving these whole, and sometimes I do that, um, I like to leave a little bit of the root on for a little rest of I like quality. to snack on those. <laughs> okay, so while you're cooking, you can also cut the roots yeah. off and snack on them yeah. as well. Now I'm going to leave this sweet potato as it is. I like to roast it at about 375, 400, depending on its size, for about 20 minutes. Then I'll take tongs and flip it over and do one little poke. And that, that way the steam can kind of build up in the potato for a while, but then you're, you're not keeping all of that moisture in there as it continues to cook. That's been, that's great for uh, like big baking potatoes as well as sweet potatoes. And then on the beets, I'm gonna roast them whole. If you have really, really big ones, you may wanna break them down a little bit, but these are so tiny. And I have a bit of, Olive oil here, I'm just gonna drizzle the beets with that. I like these little squeeze bottles because it's, it's focused. And then I'm putting just a little bit of salt on to get a little bit of seasoning started. I'm gonna pop that in the oven. Next step is the red onion. And we're gonna be really careful with this. So here's our stem end, I'm gonna take that off. 
and throw that in a discard or scrap pile if you're if you're composting or using it for stock. I actually love beets in stock, even though it turns Ooh, my stock red I not do that. <laughs> or pink. I often have pink or purple stock because of what I throw it in yeah. sometimes. The red onion will do that. The too. red onion will slightly do that if you get maroon carrots. You get a really nice grape Kool-Aid yes. purple. Um, but it's delicious to have those background flavors. Now on the root, normally I take the whole root off. I'm going to be careful and just give it a little haircut just to trim because I want some of the root on that'll hold my pieces together. Now I have a nice stable surface for cutting this in half. And I'm trying to really be careful about where I'm cutting based on the root here. So I'm trying to keep a little piece of that. Well, this, this layer is still a little leathery and papery. So I'm gonna take that off and discard it. And then we'll cut this into eighths or so. It kind of depends on the size of your onion. Of course, if you have little tiny candy onions, uh, you want to probably just have or quarter those. So I'm going to, you're being so stubborn. There of course. We go. Of course. On cam always on camera. Uh, cut this in half and then actually I may go third. So we're doing six on each side. And you'll notice that all my little chunks are holding together here. So I'm making sure each piece, just put the tip of my knife down where it will go through the root. And that brings a lot of stability to using a big knife like this, right? If you have the tip of the knife down. Absolutely. If you put the tip of the knife down, then the blade does the work for you. It gives you nice, even cuts. Your cuts are, will be regular, and that way everything will cook regular. All right. I have another sheet pan here. I'm just going to lay these big chunks out on the sheet pan. You can put a little oil down first if you want to, or you can flip these over halfway between cooking. I remember I've got 12 big chunks here. And a little drizzle with olive oil. And this is nice because you can kind of focus it. You don't have to drizzle way too much. And another little sprinkle of salt. And um, so on the sweet potato, that's gonna be about 40 minutes. On uh, the beets, depending on size, maybe 10, 15, 20. These tiny ones, probably 10. Uh, and then on these onions, about 10 to 12. Uh, I like to get my really dark. I don't know about yes. you. No, again, with the caramelization, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That charred flavor. Yes. Yes. That's why we love grilling so much. Why we love grilled. Okay. And so we don't have to sit there and wait for it. <laughs> Through the magic of TV, we're going to bring those out. Uh, this is about how dark I go with the onions, as you can tell. Lots of caramelization, maybe even a little crunchiness there, but I absolutely love that. The beads have kind of wrinkled up, and that's going to make skinning them much, much easier. And then my potato is also a little wrinkled, and now that it's cooled, the skin has pulled away. So like your butternut squash, Vanessa, this should be fairly easy to peel. Absolutely. Uh, and chop up. Now, I didn't roast the potato all the way to where it get, got mushy. This, so we want chunks in our salad. And I'm going to just take off the ends. It is a white It is a white flesh one. And look, the peel is really just kind of falling off in places. So we do have a little bit of color. Now you can, if you're not making a butternut squash soup, um, any of the fall and winter squashes are wonderful in this salad. Um, sweet potato is good. Any root veg, if you uh, are getting little turnips, especially those haruke or uh, Asian variety turnips, they're marvelous. Just roast it up and toss in this. Uh, anything you like, uh, celery root would be oh, wonderful. Would be delicious. I want to say too, I think sometimes white vegetables get a bad wrap. So just to put my dietitian hat on for a second, some of you might be thinking, am I still going to get the same nutrition from a white sweet potato that I would from an orange sweet potato? And absolutely you will. You're just going to get different antioxidants. There are antioxidants that are present in white vegetables like cauliflower, onion, and garlic um, that are going to be just as useful in fighting off any sort of oxidation that might be occurring in our body. And of course, there's tons of fiber in there as well. So no reason to discount the whites. We're gonna have all kinds of, we're gonna have such a colorful lunch today. Leave that, that. And then I'll show you on these little beets, you can just start 
popping them oh, it's so out of the skin. I'm leaving this one home because it's so adorable. Like your little, your new little kitten. But <laughs> we were talking pets before we started. Yes. Beets too, gonna be full of fiber, vitamin C. Um, again, lots of those deeply pigmented vegetables that contain tons of antioxidants too. Um, and you know, sometimes too, I've noticed Tanya that the, the smaller vegetables tend to be maybe a little bit sweeter, a little bit less strong. So maybe have you noticed that people I have are noticed, yeah. unsure about the beets? Yeah, like I said, this these this is the way if you if you think if you're convinced socialized to think <laughs> that you don't like beets. And I have converted, I converted our former dean of the College of Ag to beets while he was still uh, our fa faculty chair here at the Food Connection. Uh, so that was a triumph. But if you don't think you like beets, yeah, the, um, tiny vegetables, one, they're more tender, they're not as tough, and uh, they have a lot more sweetness. Um, it's kind of, I guess, the small size. <laughs> yeah, it's the small size. Yeah, and, and the higher heat too. So again, these were all roasted in a 400 degree oven. I saw that that question come through, and you know, it makes it just sort of. It's kind of simple too that all these vegetables can take that same temperature. Uh, yeah, root veg. You know, I, the onions you're going to pull out a little early, of course. Uh, and I was doing my beets on the same tray as the potato. What I typically, well, what I did for this batch was just to take the tray out, pull the potato off, and pop it back in the oven while I pulled the beets out. Those are so tiny, I just gave a little chop to them. And finally, my uh, onions are already like this. I'm just going to pull them off the tray when I get ready to make a salad. As far as the salad, I'm going to take get rid of my beet gloves. Um, and put some on for the salad. Now, I'm doing this to save having to turn around and wash my hands every time I do this, because what we're gonna do next is we're going to massage the greens of the salad. Actually, I'll probably just do one glove for that. So I'm gonna take my kale, and I've got some of this already done, but this is so tender, you can just hold the stem and pull the leaf off of it. Uh, if you have tiny kale, Baby kale, you probably don't even need to do this step. Stems are completely, totally edible. Uh, it's just they're a little bit tough um, and yeah, a little bit fibrous. So uh, this is super tender kale. Want a fun fact about kale? Yes, please. I love facts about kale. I love fun facts. So um, I, you know, you've got to be careful what you read off the internet when it comes to food. But when it comes to kale, a fun fact is that I don't know if you've ever, anyone knows anything about Scotland, but it's a huge sort of base for the national cuisine of Scotland. So much so that in dialect Scots, the word kale is synonymous for food. <laughs> and if you are off one's kale and you're too sick to eat your soup. What is the dish? Oh gosh, when I was there, I had a lot of like kale mixed with root vegetables, like turnips, like potatoes. Um, they make soups out of that. They'll use it as a base for roasted meats. But yeah, it was just used a lot in a lot of the different sort of national dishes of Scotland, especially back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> well, and it's so hardy in cooler climates. So. Yeah, and, and as Tandy noted, it gets sweeter with that um, colder climate because with the the less sun the less hours of sun that go along with the colder seasons the kale doesn't have to put has doesn't have as much energy to put into the leaves so much and it's going to be able to develop all of the good sugars on the inside instead of trying to grow on the outside perfect explanation uh so i've got i've just torn up the kale and a little bit of this arugula you could do it with anything you like and I'm going to take a tiny bit of olive oil and just, you can just take a teaspoon of it and put on here. And massaging is the actual term. I'm going to take my hand and squeeze and kind of press and work that oil in. You can also add a pinch of salt. Both of these things, the uh, pressure of your hands and the salt help to break down the cells. Uh, the plant cells in the leaves, break them apart, crush, crush them, uh, and so you'll start to see that it's darkening, that it's wilting as if I'm cooking it. So it is alternating. Uh, 
denaturing the cell. I don't know if those terms are sure that we can use it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're you're breaking down those natural fibers with a sort of a cross between that physical breaking down and then also a chemical breaking down, right? Because the salt is helping to draw some of the water out of out the of this, yeah, out yeah. Of salt. Because salt and water, they love each other. They, they do. Bond they follow so each other. Easily. <laughs> yep. So we're going to set that aside and let it continue. It wilts a little bit more. So if you're doing this salad ahead, you might want to massage just a, a few minutes before you get ready to serve it. While we do that, we're going to work on our vinaigrette. I've seen you do this a bunch of times. I love doing it with the students here on campus. It's to make your own vinaigrette in a jar because it's super fun. Um, again, you have to work out a little energy. A little aggression. <laughs> a little aggression. Uh, we're going to start with some ginger. I wanted to show you this. If you are part of the UK CSA, I don't know if the other farms do it. They just dug all their ginger. That is it's beautiful. absolutely beautiful. This is not quite as pungent as what you'll find in the grocery store. It's a little younger. The skin, you almost don't need right to off. peel it. Yeah. Or you could just pull it right off, take a spoon, grate it off. I went ahead and grated that off of my chunk. I have a clove of garlic as well. I'll need to pop that skin off, just like Vanessa showed you. Just put your knife on there and take the heel of your hand and press. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grate all of that. A lot of people ask me about, do you have a garlic press? I hate cleaning out a garlic I hate press. Garlic presses. I'm going on record. Uh, so I'm just gonna grate this. You can mince it up with your knife, but I thought since I'm gonna grate the um, Ginger, I would do this with the garlic as well while I have the microplane out. Danny, have you ever used a spoon to peel ginger? I have used a spoon to peel ginger. It's that very works simple. Well. Yeah. yeah, and you don't have to worry about cutting yourself or like exactly. having a knife blade pointed at yourself. You can also get a lot of uh, international markets will carry if you use that prepared garlic, then they also have a prepared ginger and garlic paste. Uh, in a lot of uh, Indian groceries, South Asian markets. Kind of frozen in little cubes too. Yes, uh, love those because cooking for myself, I can't go through a big handful of ginger. That's about a teaspoon of each. I'm gonna pop that down in my jar. I have about six tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. It really doesn't matter what kind of vinegar mm -hmm. you use, just whatever you like. Uh, sherry vinegar would be nice, white wine, anything that's kind of light and clean would be really good with this. So I went ahead and shook it with the vinegar in there. Again, that acid uh, helps to denature some of the plant fibers and cells. I also have a teaspoon and a half of ground turmeric. Now this is also grown, I don't think you can see this or not. This is grown here at South Farm and they dried it and ground it up. And Vanessa, do you yes. have facts about turmeric, turmeric and ginger and all of these? So uh, turmeric is really a hot item in re nutrition research right now um, because of the compound that it contains, which is curcumin. They're looking to see really what it can do. I think there, there's not a lot of um, promises that they can make yet, but they're looking at things like celery growth, um, arthritis medications, um, even weight loss, um, cancer research. They haven't found any kind of definites yet, but I know even here on UK campus, they're doing research, research on curcumin. Yeah. yeah, so it's also a really nice flavor. It's kind of a, a cross between sort of a very mild horseradishy kind of heat and then sort of a flowery, floral, almost yes. tea like yes uh so it's wonderful especially when you again when you can you get, get it fresh. fresh yeah so i'm gonna add just to balance out some of the acidity and some of that uh, heat i have uh, two teaspoons of or sorry two tablespoons of local honey we've got midway honey and uh, hosey honey and then i have some mustard and this is from jennifer gleason over at sunflower sundries uh, beautiful mustard and all kinds of other products with corn and things that are grown on our farm, jams, jellies, etc. The best corn chips ever. Best, best tortilla chips ever. <laughs> Hickory King corn chips. They're at here in Lexington. They're at the co-op. Now I added about twice as much uh, oil as I did to my vinegar. One, two to three times uh, is usually the standard formula for a vinaigrette and you give it a good shake once you get that lid on well. This is great for kids to help out with as long as you get that lid on well. Very uh, it's, it's a great uh, way to 
show them how they can mix up their own vinaigrette. So we're gonna take our kale, and I had some already ready. I'm gonna add in most of my sweet potato. I always like to reserve a little bit of all my ingredients for the top. I don't have many beets till my others get done, so we're just gonna toss those in. Now I'm gonna toss my onions in. Uh, they've broken down quite a bit. If you find that your roots are still held together, you may wanna take a moment and just chop that root out. Not get the potato peel in there. But chop that root out uh, so that your little bits come apart. But frankly, I just love them like this. And we're going to give this a toss. This looks so good, it could really be a main dish. It could. I mean, you could add like a, a, some kind of legume to it. I've got eggs and cheese here. We're going to put a spoon or two of the vinaigrette on. Uh, whenever I have classes do their vinaigrette, I'm like, just spoon it around, toss it, don't drown all of these wonderful vegetables that farmers have worked so hard to grow. Let them shine. Exactly. One so, tip I like there too is to dress the bowl, not the salad. Right. I've seen that too, where you yeah. just drizzle it around the outside of the bowl and then toss your veggies in there. So I have um, a plate right here. And we're going to load up with salad. And of course, with these kind of ingredients, a lot of your stuff goes to the bottom, which is sometimes why I reserve a little bit so that you can actually see it. Uh, if you're doing just a bowl for a buffet, then reserve a few things to sprinkle on top for more meat. For more meat. And I've got this lovely Chelsea's egg here, which might turn pink because of my knife. <laughs> I'm going to quarter that with a little salt, pepper, and we'll put some Kenny's Kentucky Blue on top. We'll put these two together. Looks so good. All right, so let's make a little. And there we go. And that is a beautiful fall lunch. Oh my gosh, Chef Tanya and Vanessa, it looks amazing. Can you, can you like hold the salad and the soup? It's like a little bit, <laughs> just so we can get a little bit more. <laughs> that looks great. Um, uh, we got lots of great comments coming, coming in through the chat too. Um, does anyone have any final questions? Um, you can put those in the chat and I know we had one holdover question from the soup, which was just, um, Vanessa, do you ever put fresh herbs into the soup or do you always just reserve them as a garnish? You could certainly put fresh herbs into the soup, but I would do it at the very end. That way you won't be sacrificing any of the flavor or the color that might occur with the, the heat of cooking. Um, very yeah. similar to what I was saying about the spices earlier, but yeah, fresh herbs, you know, it could go in any direction really, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. certainly thyme or sage or even a little bit of margarine would be really nice. Um, or maybe even if you were using coconut milk, a little bit of fresh basil would be delicious as well. Oh, that sounds great. Oh my gosh. These are all great tips and tricks. And we, um, Vanessa is going to be emailing everyone the recipes as well as the recording. Um, we dropped a link into uh, the chat for an event survey. So we are going to be raffling off a CSA cookbook. So go ahead and fill out the survey. It just takes a few minutes and um, we will send you a CSA cookbook and that cookbook is going to contain, it's the A to Z, um, CSA cookbook that Vanessa has. It's going to contain the recipe for the butternut squash soup, but we're also going to be sending it to you. We'll also be sending Chef T's recipe as well as other great tips and tricks. Um, and then we'll be dropping another link into the chat um, for the UK Health and Wellness CSA voucher program, just so you guys know all the details and stay in touch um, for more details there. And I'll let you guys kind of close it out, but thank you all so much. I'm gonna go on mute here and let you guys wrap up. Thanks so much, Katie and Brooke for being behind the scenes with us today. We wouldn't have been able to manage all of this without you. If you have any questions about the UK Health and Wellness CSA voucher program, please reach out to me. My name is Vanessa Oliver and you can find me at vanessa.oliver at uky.edu. And 
and I am Tanya Whitehouse again with the Food Connection. We do have some upcoming programming, so you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at UK Food Connect. And my email is Tanya, T A N Y A dot Whitehouse at UKY.edu if you have any questions for follow up from uh, the Food Connection. I'm pretty hungry. <laughs> you want some lunch? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, y'all. Thanks so much.